Well, the esophagus is a small organ. It carries food from the mouth and throat into the stomach. It's only about 10 inches long in most folks. And in these individuals with chronic conditions such as reflux or other issues, sometimes alcohol and tobacco use, can cause a cancer to develop within the esophagus. There has been an increase in esophageal cancer over the past 10 to 15 years, particularly in white middle-aged men. Uh, this reflects, I think, changes in the uh, population as individuals have a Western diet, uh, typically a bit overweight, typically some reflux associated with their overweight condition. The problem with esophageal cancer is that it blocks the flow of food from the throat into the stomach. And that blockage is experienced typically with some pain when someone eats a piece of chicken or a piece of steak or maybe a biscuit or something uh, and realize that there's a pain and some sticking sensation right here in the middle of the, right here in the middle of their chest. Hard to localize exactly where it is, but that's the impression that most folks have. Patients typically would seek medical attention uh, and evaluation is done and esophagoscopy is performed. That's an examination under, as an outpatient with some uh, local uh, medication and some sedation to examine the esophagus and to see is there a cancer there? Is there simply a stricture or blockage? And what is the extent of the problem? If it's a cancer, biopsies can be done and a diagnosis made. With that diagnosis, the patients would then be further evaluated for both the extent of the disease and if an operation or other therapies would be best applied for them. Can an operation be done safely? Does the patient have so much risk that chemotherapy and radiation instead of surgery would be recommended? Or is an aggressive approach appropriate where combinations of chemotherapy, radiation, or other therapies before resection could be used. Uh, in that manner, we can use the optimal strategies from each discipline, medical oncology, radiation oncology, and surgery to provide the patient the best possible outcome. There are multiple different ways actually to, to remove the esophagus. There are different strategies. Some involve incisions on the chest, and abdomen. Some involve incisions upon the abdomen and the neck. Typically what is done in patients with esophageal cancer is that the entirety of the esophagus is removed and the stomach is made into somewhat of a tube brought through the chest where the esophagus used to be and hooked up into the neck and to, to make sure that when the swallow the food actually goes where it should be going. Operation is major surgery, and it, as I mentioned, it can be done with a combination of multiple different types of incisions. Um, and that's typically what is done to remove the esophagus. For the individual patient, their ability to have an appropriate clinical stage prior to treatment of esophageal cancer is essential for their treatment planning. The clinical stage is the best estimate based upon x-rays and other studies, evaluations by the surgeon or the gastroenterologist or the medical oncologist of the extent of the disease, size, number, location, character of lymph nodes, sometimes biopsies are required. What that does is provide a very detailed description of the extent of the disease. In patients that have a very early stage of disease where it may just involve the lining of the esophagus, surgery alone may be very effective, no chemotherapy or radiation, with up to a 95% five-year survival. In patients that have esophageal cancer that penetrates the wall of the esophagus, the rich lymphatic channels, this is what carries the lymph fluid up and down the esophagus, can drain into lymph nodes nearby, can involve other areas of the esophagus. 
in which case surgery alone can be done, but it may not be adequate. Cancer cells may be missed. So our ability to integrate other therapeutic strategies such as chemotherapy or radiation together with surgery is very effective. Basically, before you come into surgery, you need to do your normal routine. Don't do anything that's out of the ordinary. Um, you just do your daily routine, you'll come in with less anxiety and less you know, stress about it. The night before surgery, you're not going to have anything to eat. And then in the morning of surgery, you're going to report to the hospital where you're going to spend some time in the waiting room and then some time in the preoperative area where they're going to put some IVs in you, um, listen to you, get your consent for surgery. And your operation should probably take anywhere from two hours to about five hours. And you'll go back to the same um, recovery area while they wake you up from anesthesia. Um, after that, you're going to be transferred to our post-op floor here at Vanderbilt. It's the ninth floor um, where the nurses are very specialized in the type of surgery you had. Typically what happens is a, a patient will come in, they will go forth with their procedure, and once their surgery is completed, they'll go to the post-anesthesia care unit where a group of nurses and doctors will help recover them from the anesthesia and make sure that their pain is well controlled. From that point on, often the patients will be transferred to the post-surgical floor where after they're stabilized, we'll work towards getting their oxygen off uh, work towards getting their chest tubes removed. Typically with, with any kind of uh, surgery that involves the chest and in particular the lung, the chest tubes will be placed intraoperatively. And depending on why the tubes were placed, where they were placed, and um, uh, for other purposes, we'll determine that they'll need to come out over a time frame typically measured in days in some circumstances, it'll be a time frame measured in hours, and in rare circumstances, it's a time frame measured in weeks. We know that patients are going to have pain after any kind of chest surgery, and there are multiple ways of um, preventing it from occurring and then treating it when it does occur. Oftentimes, in patients who have had thoracoscopic surgeries, which involve small incisions in the chest, and in most, if not all, circumstances, chest tubes being placed during and after the procedure, we will treat those patients with what we call a patient-controlled analgesia. And what that involves is the patient will have the medication at the bedside, and that patient will be able to use a button to administer their own medications on an as-needed basis. Digestion of food actually occurs in the small bowel, so its digestion is actually quite normal. And, but what some people can have is a little bit of troubles with particular types of food. Some people say bread doesn't work so well, or steak, or heavy type meats. But more often than not, people's swallowing ability is markedly better after removing the esophagus and reconstructing things than when they had the darn tumor in place. They get marked improvement in their ability to swallow, and that tends to stay that way. There is a nerve that goes to the voice box, and it runs right between where you have to work on the esophagus and the windpipe, called the trachea. The nerve is called the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It starts in the back of the neck, it goes down into the chest, and then it comes back, and it provides innervation to how we talk. Sometimes that can get pushed on, and it doesn't like that. And it, what would happen is the voice would change and it would become hoarse. But other than that, associated with esophageal removal, voice should not change. The ability to breathe should not change. Swallowing should be improved from before the operation. So typically, and that's pretty rare, this, where if this nerve is injured, that occurs typically less than 5% of the time. So it, it, the voice pretty much is normal after surgery. Our ability at Vanderbilt to integrate a multidisciplinary strategy, a personalized approach to the patient's 
esophageal cancer is crucial to optimizing a successful long-term outcome. Our ability to do that is a distinctive competence that we have. Our Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center and its members uh, have dedicated their professional and clinical careers to understanding and treating and eventually eliminating cancer as a disease threat. And I'm very happy to be part of that. We have a number of clinical trials open here at the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center and the Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Uh, at the Cancer Center, we have over 200 clinical trials that are open for cancers, for cancer patients of all types. Uh, we have a number of them in lung, esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer, among others. These clinical trials are, some are done here only at Vanderbilt. Many are done in cooperation with government sponsored groups. Uh, we're a member of the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group, as well as the American College of Surgeons Oncology Group. Uh, this multi-institutional model for cancer patient treatment is very effective because it allows cancer patients throughout the United States to receive state-of-the-art care by physicians in their community. Clinical trials ask a question, a clinical question that has the potential to benefit a patient or a group of patients compared to a standard therapy. A clinical trial examines a standard treatment, typically with the standard treatment and something else. So patients receive very appropriate and known effective therapy for their disease. One group of patients may receive another something, whether that's an operation or another chemotherapy drug or another combination of drugs or therapies that extra something has some advantages with, associated with it and some disadvantages. These clinical trial questions are evaluated by independent bodies called the Institutional Review Board. This Institutional Review Board examines these clinical trial questions, physicians, laymen, clergy, nurses sit on this and, are, and, are, and have a mandate to evaluate the ethical, moral, safety, and scientific aspects of these clinical trials. As I mentioned, there are phase one, phase two, and phase three studies. Phase one studies are looking um, to see what that drug does in a patient and maybe the first time the drug's been used in a patient. And those studies are very important in their own right but most of this type of studies that we utilize in our thoracic program here, the thoracic clinic, are studies that are a bit more mature, phase two or phase three studies. These studies involve therapies that have been around now probably for at least a couple of years at this point, one to two years, have shown some hints that they may be very act, that they may be active. And in the case of phase three studies, they may well be, uh, they are being compared to the standard of care in hopes that uh, the newer therapy is actually superior. The potential benefits of participating in a clinical trial include the opportunity to take part in a study that may provide treatment that turns out to be better than the currently available treatment. That is one big potential plus. Um, minimally, 
patients will receive um, optimal treatment by being part of the, uh, of the clinical trial and will receive what's currently considered the state of the art. Um, they tend to get exceptional care because there are research nurses involved with the care as well as the physicians involved and so um, very exquisite detail is paid to the attention of the patient and their particular care. Vanderbilt physicians are involved with a large um, collaboration of physicians from throughout the country. They meet many times a year and they, the, I feel they have the best minds. They all sit around and they, they talk about the different protocols that they've been working on, the research that they've published, things that have been going on um, overseas in Europe. They come together and they discuss all, the, all these uh, protocols and procedures and then as a group, they implement these new protocols and procedures at the different medical centers. There's constant communication going on. Um, there's wonderful minds at work. And I just feel it's very innovative and cutting edge for technology for today's medical science. When you're on a clinical study, um, we provide the patient with a lot of information with our phone numbers, a contact person, and I always instruct the patient to make sure that your primary care physician knows that you're in a clinical trial. Um, we'll, we'll also be in contact with that referring physician so that in the event this patient, you're three hours away from Vanderbilt, you're sick, you have to go see your primary care doctor, your doctor's aware that you're in a clinical study, that this may be possibly a side effect that you're experiencing from the clinical study. They can just quickly call us up and we can work it out. Rarely, if at all, uh, are there any additional costs um, involved with the participation of a clinical trial. Uh, most um, insurance companies or Medicare um, fund uh, clinical trials and what is not covered by insurance oftentimes will be picked up by the study itself or the sponsor of the study such as a pharmaceutical company. So cost rarely should be a concern for a patient involved in the study and I think um, important to note is that we review all that before the patient goes on the study so there are no surprises. We want to ensure that each patient has the consideration for a clinical trial, each patient be offered participation in a clinical trial if they would so desire. And in that way, each patient can receive, to the best of our understanding here at Vanderbilt, can receive the latest therapy for their disease. I think the, the, the final message that I would like to offer to particularly to patients who have been recently diagnosed with lung cancer or the physicians who may have made that diagnosis um, is uh, to consider, strongly consider um, having patients visit Vanderbilt at least for a second opinion um, to consider um, what we have available in terms of cutting edge, either cutting edge technology uh, or um, state of the art clinical trials. and where we can hopefully offer um, some hope to those patients in terms of treatments that may not necessarily be available um, where um, at their local um, community level. Um, and I think that that is uh, one of the, uh, the major reasons for existence uh, for um, a medical center such as Vanderbilt.